Hello, everyone, and welcome to this radcast of the Solution Club at the beginning of the new world. Uh, happy to see everyone here, and we're going to jump into some cool topics, starting with what I call the conversation. And um, But first, let me give folks a chance to say hello who would like to, who would like to be on the recording, if, if you would. Uh, I mean, if you'd like, no, no, no pressure, never any pressure to speak on the Solution Club or the Block Party or any of our meetings. Uh, and something just happened. Sorry about that. Let me get us back in there. Oh, sorry, something just popped on my screen, but we're fine. Okay. Um, so would anyone like to say hello before I screen share and share a video? All right, looks like we're good. Okay, so let me screen share. Okay. All right, this is a video in a series of videos I did last night. This one's called The Conversation. So let's check it out. Here it goes. Hello, everyone. Uh Jamin Shively here. The topic is the conversation. And this is one of what I mentioned uh, of the set of big globally transformational things that is missing, sorely missing and urgently needed uh, here on planet Earth. In fact, I would like to make an invitation to everyone who basically gets it uh, to join me, to join us in the conversation uh, at the Collective Intelligence Block Party and at the Solution Club, both of which you can find out information and links on radish.org. So please check it out. So what is the conversation? The conversation is fundamentally um, a conversation about that seeks to answer the question, how do we, humanity as a whole, how do we <clears throat> come together to save life on Earth? Okay. Now, I see that conversation as having three major pillars, right? One is, what is our goal or what are our goals specifically? And what I'm really talking about is an end state. What is the end state we want to get to? Our goal is to get here. We are here, our goal is to get here. And that here, that end state is a hyper object. Um, and, uh, you know, I make the analogy, it's like if I want to get to a specific address in New York City, and I'm way over here on the West Coast, um, I don't need to know the specific address I'm going to until I'm actually within, I don't know, 30, 40 miles of New York City, because then that'll dictate whether I go on this route or that route or whatever. But until I'm 98% of the way there, I don't need to know that last bit of information. Um, likewise, uh, I don't think we have to have the goal to, you know, uh, hyper-defined, if you will, um, uh, until uh, later. But we can start out with, with kind of a general goal. And, you know, rather than um, leave that hanging, I'll just articulate my vision of the goal, where we want to get to. Um, but first, let me point out the, um, the other two big pillars of um, the conversation, right? So we got the goal. The next is the strategy. How are we going to get there? Right? Okay, real simple. Goal, strategy to get there. And the third is, okay, strategy, pie in the sky, that's great. What are we focused on right now? What are the immediate next steps? And I focus on the three next steps. Uh, one, two, three. Um, so just really briefly, the immediate next step for me is to get all of this communication that is in this series that this video is a part of on my YouTube channel, to get all of this communication as tight as possible. Um, and then 
my next two steps after that, two and three, both relate to um, the topic of the Brooklyn singularity, uh, which I talk about more in its own in its own video. Um, and the topic of strategy is something I cover in its own separate video called Uber Strategy, not like the taxi, but like really big Uber Strategy. <laughs> and uh, so right now I'll just focus on the third pillar, which is the first, <laughs> that of the goal. So what is the goal? So um, uh, I just, I'm just starting to articulate it. Remember I said like, it doesn't have to be totally precise. And so I started off by saying that my big, big, big goal is that all of humanity eat uh, nutritious, whole food, plant-based diets that are immune boosting and have plenty to eat um, and have the rest of their basic needs met, like shelter and healthcare, et cetera, um, as well as you know some higher needs like access to the arts, to recreation, to nature, uh, meditation, all kinds of great resources that are, um, you know, you know, basic and beyond, I would say. Sounds like Bed Bath and Beyond, but anyway. Um, and that we find deep meaning and purpose in caring, we can, that we become what um, Silas, Dr. Silas Rao mentions as, Homo ahimsa, kind of a, I just think of it as a caring species, a very united and very caring species, um, caring for each other and caring for Mother Earth. Um, and that, that caring is the source of our joy and fulfillment and peace. And, uh, and by the way, I'm just kind of articulating in my own terms. A lot of this was inspired by Dr. Silas Rao, uh, by, by Shelley, um, with the, um, oh, goodness, I'm blanking it because they have different, anyway, Shelley Ostroff, Jan, Shelley and Jan and all their good stuff. Um, but, but basically that, um, you know, the game of life then becomes number one, caring, but number two, finding and creating the balance between what is fundamentally our caring work. So when we're caring for our elders or caring for children or, you know, feeding those in need or whatever, when we're doing this, that's what I call caring work. It's, you know, real physical work, not necessarily physically strenuous, but it could be more mental, uh, it could be spiritual, but it is real work, it's caring work. And then um, the balance between that caring work and creative work in whatever realms there are outside of the caring work. Um, and um, this is really kind of a tricky one because I, you know, I have to acknowledge and I invite everyone to acknowledge that so much of what we've learned that, you know, we want, right, is stuff that was taught to us. It's learned, right? It's socialized in us, in many cases beaten into us, the urgency of accumulating, 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 and if you don't accumulate you know, you're going to die and no one's going to want to marry you. And, you know, you're just going to die alone, homeless on the streets, suffering, miserable, humiliated. No, 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 no. So, you know, we're taught that if we want to make it, huh, you know, we have to accumulate and accumulate at the level of the individual. So it's a very specific game that we've been taught. And it turns out that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's the single biggest engine of planetary destruction. Uh, of, 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 an, of many, um, but I think that's the biggest in my humble opinion, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the main point is that, well, there's a lot of points, but one is that so many of the things that we think we want 
like, oh, I want lots of land and big houses. This is stuff that we were taught to want, right? I don't think any of that is really natural or innate in us. Um, so uh, it'll, but it'll be a really interesting, you know, part of the game is finding this balance between, you know, the care, again, the caring work, uh, which is essential. And then, all right, with all of our other free time, like, what do we do? What do we focus on? Uh, you know, hobbies, entertainment, arts, travel, uh, hoarding. Ooh, probably better stay away from that. But I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, let's, let's see. Let's have the conversation and find out. And... Um, Anyway, what I'm really just trying to do is kick something off here by giving some of my ideas. I'm not trying to win the Nobel Peace Prize and say, oh, what a great vision Jamin has. Or, you know, <laughs> I'm just kicking off the topic uh, partly to give it just to give a taste, but a very important taste. And again, we'll cover the other parts. Um, in, in strategy and, and the Brooklyn singularity and other places, but you know, we've got to have the conversation. Let's have the conversation. What is the goal? What is the world we want? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. What, what it might look like, what life might look like in that world. You know, where are we living? You know, what are we doing? What's, you know, what's the game? What's the culture? What's the cultural story? Are we on video conferences with each other? Are, you know, are we meeting in person? You know, all kinds of good stuff. So, um, and I just want to nod, give a nod to uh, my colleague, Michael Gosney, uh, the Sierra Club dinner I put together where he was our main guest speaker on arcologies and the great after dinner discussion we had afterwards. We talk about a lot of these things at that, at that Sierra Club dinner. Um, and, uh, oh shoot, that was a while back. It was like January 2019 or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, let's have the conversation. This is an urgent missing. And so again, my call to action is if you get it, that we need to have this conversation, then join me and others at the block party and at the uh, Solution Club in talking and having the conversation. What do we want to achieve? What's our strategy to get there? How do we start? All right, so please join us. Thanks so much. See you soon. All righty, back to video conference mode here. Um, <clears throat> I found that very helpful to watch just listening to myself, um, you know, those thoughts I crystallized last night. But, you know, um, I'll just take the microphone here for a moment and, and just add or edit on top of that uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, and I'd love to hear from everyone. Uh, but, um, you know, there's a lot of great projects happening out there in the world. Oh, you know, the, the, this group is working on solar panels. These are working on community gardens. This one over here is working on a new form of democracy. And this one over here, da, da, da. there's all this great stuff that's happening out there in the world. Um, but for me, there is a gigantic elephant in the room that's taking up 95% of the room that no one's talking about. Everyone's kind of tiptoeing around the elephant. The elephant in the room is, uh, hey humanity, uh, wake up, chop, chop. Um, it's five o'clock in the morning and hot lava is flowing towards the town. Um, what is our plan for saving ourselves? What is our plan, not just ourselves as humanity, but all of complex life. Now that we have the power to destroy, even destroy by default, that's still power to destroy. Um, and we have the power to, to change things. So uh, we need to first have the conversation. What's our plan? What's our strategy? What's our plan, et cetera? But before, sorry, it's a bit bright here. So um, I'm not trying to look like a famous person, but you know, but before we can talk about strategy and plan, right? 
there's a presumed there. There's a presumed goal, a place that we want to get to, right? And, well, so let's talk about that. So let's talk about all these things. And I've broken it down, as I just mentioned in the video, into goal, strategy, and immediate next steps, right? You see how that kind of crystallizes it along three axes that are just crucial. Where do we want to get to? What's the goal? How are we going to get there? What's the strategy? And how do we start? That is the elephant in the room that is taking up 95% of the room that nobody's talking about. I mean, nobody's talking about it in those crystal clear terms that in turn bring it right down to the right here and now, chop, chop, what do we do now? What do we focus on, right? Anyway, that's what I wanted to say briefly. I'm gonna go on mute. Uh, there's there's so few of us here that we don't need to have a cue or anything like that. So if you have something to say, just jump in or type it into the chat and one of us can, can read it. Um, so just jump in, please. Okay. Um, I thought a lot about hoarding and uh, people um, needing to acquire. Um, I actually had a relationship. A, fr a friendship it was difficult to have a friendship with her but I had a friendship with a real hoarder who filled her home with stuff so that you couldn't move in it and it it almost killed her and um you know when things fell on top of her and um that's the sort of very visual manifestation of it I mean you've got the billionaires hoarding mansions and hoarding money that's just the same kind of mentality but on a bigger level but it was very hard to have a conversation with her about anything because it all came back to stuff you know it was like the, the stuff got in the way of literally everything every thought that, that she had was about stuff I mean what are your thoughts on that everybody on hoarding yeah, yeah. You know, I kind of distinguish two, two broad classes of hoarding. One is, is the, the friend of yours you described, and we, we've all known folks like that, where it's all about stuff, stuff, stuff. Um, and then the other is kind of the macro hoarding, the hoarding of life-giving resources, right? For me, that's, by, that, that's really what I'm referring to. Um, filling one's house with all kinds of clutter is, um, I see that as, as an illness, right? And um, that's a different class of illness than the illness of boundless hoarding of life giving resources. And by the wealthy hoarding those life giving resources, they are literally taking life away from life that very much wants to happen. Right. And has every much a right to be here as, as, as humans. And um, so that's really the biggie that I've been focusing on when I talk about have you have you ever known any of those um squillionaire hoarders uh, which which kind the, the squillionaire hoarders oh, i call them squ squillionaires because they've got so many millions oh but, but well, well i i actually have um a few friends who are billionaires and many who are 100 millionaires and whatnot um i worked at microsoft for for a number of years um i was corporate strategy manager there so i got to know like all the top folks including including bill gates and um so in that circle and others um i've gotten to know quite a few and um well not quite a few actually i just say it I'm, I'm i'm friends with a few i've gotten to know a number more but um as as a group um and i've said this about bill gates i've got a lot of problems with bill gates a lot of respect for him but a lot of disagreement as well and um I've, I've referred to Bill Gates as the biggest heroin addict in the world. His particular flavor of heroin is money and, and accumulation. Um, oh, Jackie's joining us. Awesome. Um, and, uh, but, hey, Jackie, welcome. Welcome. How you doing? We are, rec we are recording. And um, we just played one of the videos that I recorded late last night on the conversation. I don't know if you had a chance to see that, but we just played it. Um, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll recap. I'll just recap it now. Um, 
I yeah. watched the first four. Like the Pardon first. Me? I watched the first four. I didn't get to the rest. Oh, okay. Um, I think uh, the conversation may have been. Um, let's see here. No, oh, that was part four. So, the, so the the very last one was the conversation. So you're totally up to speed, Jackie. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for thanks for watching that. Um, so um, that's where we that's where we're launching off from now, and um, and so we can get back to the the topic of hoarding. But I want to I'd, I'd like to actually kind of if it's all right with you, I'd like to kind of focus on the the big picture conversation which is how are we gonna save life on earth? That's the elephant in the room that nobody, you know, other than us and folks like us, want to talk about, want to deal with, right? Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say somewhat cynically a perspective um, uh, that just kind of in a cartoon-like way characterizes what seems to be a lot of people's response uh, to this planetary crisis. Um, how to profit from an overheating world. Oh, you can invest in this and this and this and this, and, you know, and, and what that characterizes for me is this uh, a belief that basically, you know what, the fabric is fine, the platform is fine, right? We can keep riding our motorbike, metaphorically, I speak a lot in metaphors, um, but we can basically just keep doing whatever the hell we want hoarding, accumulating, chopping down trees, dumping here and there, doing what, killing animals, whatever. We can keep doing all that ad nauseum with no end in sight and the platform will hold, the Titanic will hold. We can just bust through whatever icebergs, the Titanic will hold, it's unsinkable, right? So, um, and, you know, all of that avoids what for me should be I mean, imagine a scenario where it was like just detected that there's an asteroid coming towards planet Earth and it's due to impact planet Earth in five years, right? That would be the talk of the nightly news. And the talk, okay, so what do we do about it? Well, let's go here. Uh, look, in the nation's capital, the president's about to make a statement about the deployment of nuclear technology and this and that. And here we've got the head of NASA and the head of whatever. Uh, you know, boom, here's the press conference. Meanwhile, in, in Moscow, uh, Putin has, 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 you know, said that they'll use the hypersonic missiles to take out the asteroids and is offering joint internet, you know, it would be the talk of the day. There would be nothing else to talk about. Well, this asteroid is not coming in five years, it's coming in five months or less. And no one is having the conversation. I mean, it's unreal. A few of us get together, you know, in this kind of dark, shady video conference room on the far reaches of the web, you know, that nobody knows about, you know? And we're like, I, I see it coming. Do you see it? Yeah, I see it too. Why doesn't anyone else talk about it? You know, and this actually, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll bring it really close to home right now and talk about an app that's been under development. And in, in our last couple big meetings on the app, the, the K-Mama app, um, which I fully support, by the way, there's, it, it seems to me that I'm, I'm having this tug of war between what I'll just call this, this eeny weeny focus on, well, let's get the app built and let's get it launched in one city. And, let's, and I'm saying, let's have the conversation including what's the big picture strategy? What are our immediate next steps, right? The conversation has three fundamental parts. The title of the conversation, which is not one of the three parts, the title is how do we save life on earth? That's the big elephant in the room question. And built into that question is the implied assumption that we're going down by default. Like some saving needs to happen. Right. It's not like, well, you know, if we don't make some changes by 2050, then we're really in trouble. No, no, no. We're going down now and say, yeah, yes. So go ahead. Go ahead. It's, um, it's like an epidemic of pessiness. Well, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic of delusion for one thing, 
right? But it's also, but it's also pettiness, this endless focus on my food, my wage, my this, my small thing, you know, my pettiness. Absolutely. My ego, my, my stuff, my hoarding, my stash, my standing in society, right? My job security, my food security, my, my, me, me, my, 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 my bunker. All right, the rest of you can all go to hell, but me and mine are going to be fine in my bunker. I mentioned these billionaire friends of mine, hundred millionaire friends of mine. Most of them have bunkers, right? They probably all do. I only know about a few of them, <laughs> but enough, enough of a sample size to say, holy shit, you know, it, it, it's the attitude that, you know, as long as I have mine, screw you. Why? Because that was the game that we were born into and that was beaten into us. It was beaten into us at the playground. It was beaten into us at the spankings at home. It was beaten into us by the humiliation. It was beaten into us by every aspect of this barbaric game that we were born into, right? It's like we were born into the most violent favela in Brazil, where there's just knife fights, gun fights, drugs, prostitution, disease, you know, hoarding, misery, this, that, gangs, everything, right? We're born into it. And as a little baby, you know, we start getting kicked around until we learn how to fight and defend ourselves to save our lives for crying out loud. Well, you know, fast forward 20 years. And now this little five-year-old kid that learned how to fight is now a 25-year-old gang leader killing people, right? What I want to do is the first thing that came to mind was I want to grab the five-year-old kid and say, no, 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 don't go, that, don't, don't go down that path. But that's the path of survival, right? And being able to pass on his genes. He may not make it past the age of 30, but he got seven women pregnant, right? You know, because he was the badass dude with all the bling, fancy cars, money, guns, whatever. Yes, so go for it. Well, what's, what's the common denominator with us bunch then? That we resist, we resist that, you know, hoarding story. Look, look it's, not so much, it's not so much that we resist hoarding, right? Because, you know, I, um, you know, I hoard to a degree. I'm also super generous and I've pretty much spent all, almost all my money um, on the work that I do. And... Um, no regrets there. But the reality is that I do hoard. I do look at, you know, this, that portfolio, whatever, you know, I do try to save so that I can have some, you know, some funds to, to do what I do, including this. And um, so it's, it, I'd say it's, it's not that we're exempt from it. You know, we all need to manage resources in order to survive. So, um, so it's not that we don't play the game. We do, you know, but you know, we, we just don't play it to excess, I would say. Um, but really what character but, but, we're, but we're actively engaged in resisting it. well look we're, know, we're, we're, we wouldn't actually be talking about you know earth is going down you know we wouldn't be talking about that if we hadn't there'd been some concerted effort or inclination to resist all that so everybody who's part of this conversation they have already separated themselves that hunker you know focused on on their the little things yeah 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 to totally um no it, it's it's it, all you're saying is true what you're saying is true so let me actually just go to the high level really quickly and maybe talk about some of the things that characterize us who we are right it's not just that we're resisting the economy of hoarding right um that although that's absolutely true um what i'm saying that the bigger picture is that we are here willing to look at the big picture and look at the horror of the big picture and the, the, the speed with which the asteroid is hurtling toward us and that we've got to do something. And we look around us and we talk to other people and they're like, well, what, what asteroid, man? That, that's like a, you know, no, nah, the earth will be fine. The earth will be fine. She's always been fine. Da, da, da. I mean, it's just this, uh, it, it, it's this story that, and, and, and we have to acknowledge and be responsible for um, that we are like computers who've been downloaded with some software and we're just, we're, you know, as, 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 as my sister Jackie and I in, say in Spanish, a como me tocan, bailo, 
all right? Depending on how they play the music, that's how I'm gonna dance, right? So we got downloaded with this software that said, hey, you know, dance the game of hoarding and telling the story that it's okay to hoard, that it's okay to chop down every last tree and it's, and it's okay to kill animals and eat them. It's okay to have dominion. God gave you dominion, right? What part of, you know, dominion don't you understand, right? And, and one, yeah, go ahead. And, and one other very important one as well that we don't realize, the other subliminal message they've implanted in our heads, to not take any notice of the likes of groups like us, environmentalists, um, you know, so that because they're all uh, uh, conspiracy theorists and uh, they have us all fooled because they have the control over the media. You said it yourself there a while ago, the, the hoarders, the super wealthy hoarders, are retreating to the bunkers. Why? Because they're the one percent that are clued into what's happening, because they're the ones causing the mess, and they are already, and they are already in their droves, retreating to their bunkers and buying up bunkers. And uh, does does people know making money in the is advertising bunkers for sale? Like, um, point being is that. They're retreating because they now know that the shit's about to hit the fan. And the majority of us are still in the cloud that they, they put over our, or the veil they put over our eyes. Um, when you say to most people now, you try to tell them the truth about what's going on. The, what you're talking about there, the idea of uh, even hoarding in a small way, we all do it, we're all guilty of it. The idea of losing that, is too much for people to handle to actually accept the truth. That's what's happening. They've been so well conditioned to uh, believe that there's no way any of that can happen, that the conspiracy theorists are the ones out there put, trying to put that idea in your head. They're so well conditioned to it and so afraid of losing what they have that they, will, they refuse to listen to it. And that in, therein is our problem. Our problem, right from the get-go, if you think about it, going back to meetings weeks ago, our problem we discussed about what is our main problem. Our main problem is getting the general population in the picture. Awareness is our biggest problem. Well, and, it, and getting them here is our biggest problem because they're not aware. So that is what we need to focus on, I think. You know, really good stuff, James. The, the one thing I would take exception to that I would challenge is the thing you said at the very end, which is that we need to focus on getting the message out to, you know, basically, you know, the bulk of humanity. And, um, and we definitely do, but I don't think that should be our focus right now. And so let me, let me just frame it a little bit and then I'll, I'll get to what I think our focus should be right now. But this is beautiful because th this is the conversation. And I'm not, just, I'm not saying that just because we're having the conversation that we agree on everything. No, we need to have the conversation. And that's what we're finally doing right here, right now. We're actually having the conversation. So here's how I see it. And, and I'll get really specific about the one thing I disagreed with what you said, James, but it looks like you want to say something more. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, just because just thought because I think you misunderstood. What I'm saying is that our our focus should be getting them to get them to the point of awareness and get them here. Is what I'm saying. That's our our main focus is to get them here. But we have to, we can't get them here till we get them aware. That's what I was saying. That, but we do need them here. Like. Totally, totally. No, I couldn't agree more. In, in a way, I'm I'm being a little bit dramatic and I'm exaggerating what's really a tiny difference because fundamentally we're in agreement. But let me, let, let, me, let me pull, let me unveil this thing that, I've, that I want to say, okay? So um, our goal, I think we've got a clear enough view of the goal, and we don't, we don't need, it doesn't need to be very clear right now. It just needs to be general because where the action is right now is, is in the strategy to get us towards the goal. I hope this visual works, right? I'm holding my right hand up here in the upper right. I'm saying, this is the goal. Here's where we are, right? So just imagine a straight line from one corner of my box to the other from where we are to the goal. That's the strategy. But then bring it back, bring it back, bring it back to right here, right now. What should our focus be right here, right now? And um, so um, 
at the at the risk of, of being a little bit loquacious and just jump in if you want to talk because I don't want to dominate the microphone. Just literally just jump in and say, hey, Jamin, right? You, go, go ahead, so, yeah. Um, in response to what you said, James, I've, I've given up on trying to change people. It's, you know, it's, it's, I feel it's, 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 it took me nowhere having this idea that I could convince somebody by reason or whatever. Maybe I was arrogant to think that I've got anything to say anyway, I don't know. But um, the thing is, you know, it's just, there's none so deaf as those that don't want to hear. And um, I don't want to waste my time there. I just want to go with the, the pit. Those, but Minister said something about you don't go with changing the system, you know, just go and go to a new kind of building. And I think this is what possibly this conversation is about. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Uh, so uh, I, I know I, I, I definitely agree with you. I take it on board. Um, does I, I've lost I've lost um, my urge to try and do that as well. No, at one stage I was very much, um, you know, running around with a, sense, with a sense of urgency, trying to warn those that I loved and uh, what have you, and let them know what 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 I know, like and because of the, you know the severity of it and everything. Else. Or yeah, I know I know I know what you're saying. You can't you can't just shovel all that information on top of someone that does is not willing to listen. So you have to leave it off. I understand, but uh, it's the awareness as well. The general awareness is what I'm on about. Is ma the majority of people are just generally unaware anyway. Totally, totally. So um, I really want to complete this little story that I'm telling because it gets us right down to you know, where we are today and, and what I think we should focus on. Um, but that's what I think. Please, you all tell me what you think and let's put it all on the table. Let's put all our toys on the table, put all our Lego blocks on the table and see what we can build together. But I'll start. So in the video that we just played that we shared on the conversation, which we've all seen, including Jackie, is the one where I, it starts with the goal. And I talked about, you know, I probably spent half that video talking about the goal, but even still, that's a very, you know, rough, loose uh, representation of that goal, right? That's knowing that we're going to New York City, but not knowing the address in New York City, metaphorically. Okay. What's the strategy to get there? The strategy, actually, <laughs> of all things, starts in New York City, uh, and specifically in the borough of Brooklyn. And that's what I call the Brooklyn singularity, um, which I'll talk about. But that's, that's basically the strategy begins with the Brooklyn singularity, transforming Brooklyn starting with its food networks that are, that are supplying it. And in fact, the very mode of production, right? Currently, we're in a capitalist system that, it, that goes all the way to food, which is ridiculous. It should never have been applied to food. Um, but there it was, and here it is, right? Uh, and yet capitalism is breaking by the day. Capitalism is crumbling. It's, it's simply failing to work. It works if everything is working and everything is just one continuous supply chain and there's still plenty of the Amazon left to, to mow down and there's still plenty of uh, CO2 to dump into the atmosphere and we haven't, and there's still plenty of ice left to melt, right? So as long as there's buffer, we keep chipping away at it. Well, now we simply can't do that anymore. I mean, it's just like we're, we're grounded. We're literally grounded. The economy is literally grounded. Most of it is. So everything is broken all around us. We're talking about reassembling according, according to a whole new paradigm, which, which brings us in the direction of the goal, even if we don't have it 100% clarified, right? I mean, Jackie, the fact that we're talking about feeding everyone in Brooklyn, does that make us communists? Does that make us Marxist, Leninist? No, no, no. Look, I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure some communists could do the same thing and probably effectively, but no, that doesn't make us communists. We're not, you know, but it's so it's bringing us in the direction of this utopian goal that but that's still very much in formation but just because you don't know exactly where you're going doesn't mean that you can't start so we've got this work on all ends of the pipeline simultaneously the goal the strategy which is really the connecting pipeline and then the starting point what do we do right now brass tacks enough talk what do we do and so that gets us down to steps one, two, three. Step number one is perfect this communication. 
See this conversation that we're having right now, making it concise, boiling it down into text, boiling it down into a tight three minute video and saying, hello world, we need to have the conversation already. Better late than never. And it's definitely late, but we got to do it. And here's what it is. So step number one for me is perfect this communication. Step number two is put together a whole roster of topics for the Brooklyn singularity. I'm just using that as a code name right now, right? And step number three is map out the whole trajectory from where we are literally right now this second until the time of the press conference in Brooklyn, New York. For me, that's the one, two, three. The strategy is start with Brooklyn, create a super cool example. The world participates in it, just like we're participating in it right here, right now. Literally, we've got whatever four countries represented at the moment and counting. Where are the Canadians today? I don't know what the, what the heck happened to Canada, right? They fall into the Arctic or something? Anyway, we'll figure that out. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is everyone will participate in Brooklyn. That's why I call it the Brooklyn singularity. We're doing something in, in Brooklyn that's just gonna be totally singular, like nowhere else. And it's just gonna be, wow, it's just gonna be jaw dropping what happens in Brooklyn. And the singularity within the singularity is, anyone wanna guess? <laughs> Any eager beavers in the back of the classroom? The singularity within the singularity is the press conference. That's where the singularity, that's where the tip of the match strikes the box. That's where this happens. This is the press conference in Brooklyn. You see that? That's where we're in Mission Impossible zone right now, right? 99.99% of humanity is in zombie state. Right. And yes, if you're watching this video, it's very likely you're a zombie. You've been zombified. Why? Because you're not in the conversation. If you're not zombified, there's one conversation to have. How the hell do we get out of this death spiral? Yes. So go for it. You're on mute. So I'm going to unmute you just for convenience. Okay. Uh, oh, I think we both clicked at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was listening to a little vid uh, uh, from one of the uh, people who set up Extinction Rebellion. And basically in this video, it's a recent one, they were just analysing the, the near-term history of how it all happened, you know, taking over of the five bridges in London. Now, the, the, the guy, Roger Hallam, he, he kept using the word audacious. You've got to be totally audacious. Think there and then ramp it up by five or 10 or 20, which is what, and that is the thing that gives everybody the wow factor. It's like, what, five bridges closed down in London for this many days? And you're saying, yeah, food, feed everyone. That's audacious. It's big. It's ramped up. It's like what, what you don't expect. And that's what, gives it the isn't that's it, the, it. That's yeah it. And that's a core part of the strategy brilliant so thank you for bringing that in and we have so in london the cradle of extinction rebellion giving us that news fresh from london right you know i remember back in like the 70s or 80s there were just, there were like some really rich parisians living in new york who would have fresh French bread flown in on the Concorde to New York so they'd eat the real stuff from Paris, not baked in, you know, New York, you know, French style, but the real thing. This is like that. What so just dropped on us are like fresh, in this case, English loaves, right? Hot out of the oven and delivered on the Concorde. So um, that's exactly it. That's brilliant. So that's a part of our strategy. So part of our strategy is focus, focus, focus on one singular place and one singular moment, which is the press conference where we make that audacious claim. Just like in the press conference with President Vicente Fox, we made the, the audacious claim of building an inter, the first legal international cannabis network, right? Um, the, the other thing he said was it had to be the capital city because in the capital city, you've got all the politicians 
you've got all the media and you've got the density of population so it's it's got to be there and then you've got to make it international news and you can only do that by you know having all those factors and the big city and international city brilliant and see new york is that new york is new york is sort of the default capital of the world right now for business for the old paradigm you know of money um you know london competes with it um but uh you know, there's really nothing like New York, not even Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the political capital. And in fact, in the early days of the country, I'm, I'm a direct descendant of one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and so I, I know a bit about the history. But in the, in the early days, there was a struggle between Washington, D.C. and New York, which would be the capital of the, of the country. Um, New York is the default capital. It's the media capital. It's the media hub. It's the big port. It's where everyone came when they arrived from Europe, you know, in, in the, over the centuries, right? Including very notably Ireland. And um, when we, we talked about that a lot last time, which I'm super excited about, which is bringing in the Irish connection. That's yet another thing that's going to make this thing just go viral among Americans, right? Most of whom have some Irish in them, right? And most of them came through New York, right? And so the fact that Ireland is stepping up to support the Brooklyn singularity and Brooklyn eats is crazy, right? It'll, so that, so we're, we're applying what you're talking about and, and these, this wisdom, and, and that's collective intelligence. That's, that, that's it right there. So without you, we, this conversation would not be complete. With you here, it's perfect. That's collective intelligence, right? Simple as that. So thank you, and please keep it coming. Um, so, um, the strategy then, start with one singularity and a singularity within the singularity that, it, that makes world news. And having done that before, I'm, I'm good at it. I'm like really good at it. <laughs> like the, the President Vicente Fox uh, press conference, I'm extremely proud of and learned so many lessons there, including about, you know, proactively dealing with enemies. Because we just stuffed a giant red hot poker up the you know what's of the criminal drug cartels, and they reacted, and their reaction was violent, and that's all I'll say about it now. Um, but uh, I've had years now to think about that and analyze, right? And so we we need to be very clear what we're up to, and be very clear with the world what we're up to, and that's why the conversation is so darn important. What's our goal? What's our strategy? Where do we start? Um, when you say that you were sticking this great <laughs> red hot poker, <laughs> part of the connotations up the backside of the uh, drug cartels, in <laughs> in this situation, who who is who are you sticking the rod up? <laughs> well, the, 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 the cool thing the cool thing here is that they're they're really doesn't need to be any kind of bad guy in the picture right it um, makes it more of a story though doesn't it well, so, well it, it makes it a stronger no, it, story it, 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 it certainly does you know one of the one of the default bad guys um is uh the the, the meat industry meat and dairy um but you know they're dying a natural death right now anyway yeah, right yeah. so you know it, it's uh it's 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 almost ungentlemanly to come up that with to that dude who's already been run over a couple of times by a steamroller and there's just a barely a pulse left and he's totally unconscious to come up to him and start whapping him with a baseball bat and saying bad meat and dairy industry you know it, it, it's 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 almost inhumane <laughs> not really because <laughs> Now, now I've now I've really gone over the top with my metaphors and stuff, but anyway, what, what I'm saying is they're almost dead, right? So if we want a real bad guy, right, that that's like the bad guy um, who gets killed at the very beginning of the James Bond movie, where it's you know like a like a four minute mini story that it's not even necessarily connected to the rest of the movie, right? That was meeting Derry, <laughs> who's our bad. Um, what, what, who are the meat barons? Who are the uh, yeah, cattle uh, meat barons? Yeah, there's Tyson, there's Cargill, th there's a bunch. It, it really doesn't matter, but because they're, that's what I'm saying. They're almost dead anyway. 
where, where I think so, where I think it's really going to become interesting is what because what we're doing um, is so communal and collective, and when people hear those words, they think communism. Right, Jackie, go for it. And welcome, well, Emery. Go for it, Jackie. Hi, Emery. Um, I just um, to to respond to so I I totally get where the question is coming from, and she made me think about. Um, you're right that we at least for the press conference and for like I started writing the um, email to to the Brooklyn Borough president, just throwing ideas out there, and it's really focusing on the heroes, highlighting the heroes that are already in the community doing this work. I think we're focusing on the heroes, focusing on the, on the response of the community, highlighting that. We're going in there to support what they're already doing. They already know who the bad guys are in the community that are pushing back against them. Where they, I see us as reinforcements. I see us, like um, Melvin suggested, just making the vision bigger and being the reinforcements and coming in and saying, you know, you need, to me, I see like Lord of the Rings. You know, when they were battling and all of a sudden they look and he said, look in the east when the sun rises and there's just like this whole like slew of support coming down the hill. I feel like that's what we are. Like we're all coming in to bring the support and the, the bigger vision and the, the enemies, they'll reveal themselves. They'll, they'll come out and they'll reveal themselves. And I think with our message, Again, we're not talking about profit. We're not talking about brainwashing. We're not talking about um, gaslighting anyone. We're in so much truth that I th almost think that the arguments that they have to come up with have to be so completely um, untrue. They have to, they're going to have to get ugly. And, and do they really, do they really have the opportunity to do that right now with like Jamin saying where they are? I think, you know, I, I think they see that their time and this is our time again, not to even focus on them, but focus on the heroes and the community that are already doing that and that we're just coming into support. And hopefully we'll have some politicians that, that see that and active and join us. And the rest I think will, will take care of itself. Yeah, I, I, I agree there anyway, Jackie, uh, 100%, because really there's no point playing the, the blame game anyway. So, because in a sense, as even Guy McPherson would admit, we're all part of the blame anyway. Like we all contribute in our own ways. But yeah, and in general, the big as Jamin said, the big contributors are the multi billionaire hoarders, obviously. They are a bigger contributor. Um, we all know that as well. But ultimately there's no point playing the blame game. And you're right, Jackie, we should focus on the heroes because you know, that is what we need to do is focus on the heroes to uh, that also not only makes awareness, but it also creates, it inspires, you know what I mean? It creates um, goodwill and inspires people to do likewise. And, and we have to teach our children now, that they, uh, as we should have always been with us, but teach them by example, obviously, but by good example, and, and go back to our old ways. As you were on about uh, folk stories, we need to go back to our story. We often talked about that here as well. Um, so, you know, focus on the heroes, even the Facebook page, you know, that I say and I set up, I even have one of the um, one of the sections and that is neighborhood heroes is what I called it. So for people to put up posts showing how neighbors come to each other's help in times of need. And that's those are those are inspiring posts in order to, you know, create that kind of frame of mind. That's what we need now in the world. Thanks. Oh my God, I love that. I love bringing back that whole concept of really what community is. Really, community is, we all just live in the same place, and we all pay the same HOA, and the same cops patrol the same streets. No, community is about being, just being neighborly to one another, caring, helping raise our, our children, making sure we create safe environments so our children can go and play and be free, to support one another, to be there. Like that's what's missing from our communities. And that to me, especially from impoverished, underfunded communities, that's been taken from us. They, they systematically make us turn against one another, paranoid against one another, so that we all want to hoard just like, and since there's more lack in our communities, there's even more fear. 
and there's even more paranoia. And so they make us turn on one another. And I think when we remove them from the equation and we just focus on community, the community gardens, the, the leaders in the community, the organizations and nonprofits, the churches that are already here and stop looking everywhere else and say, no, this is about us and community. And again, we see the brilliance and the pearls in this community in the action already. We're coming in here to help support that. And that's our mission, I think, is to go to wherever cities already started this initiative to come and bring that vision bigger, make it interconnected, and to help support to make that community self-sustaining each one that they can now ripple and then teach their neighboring communities. Yeah. So, uh, taking that community um, quality stuff that you mentioned and putting it on steroids, you know, you know, audacious, bigger, 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 bigger than anyone ever even thought to do. So it's yeah, putting putting all that that exists already in putting it on steroids. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and just thinking about it, I know as well, just during this conversation, I know, I know I started off earlier there, Jamin, about, uh, you know, about the awareness side of it and everything else, but I suppose having just watched, um, you know, recently watched uh, uh, John Moore and uh, Stuart Scott on the scientist this morning, um, that they brought on Facebook there last month, or on uh, YouTube just last month. Um, uh, no more normal. Uh, having watched that and looking at John Doyle's other talk to the uh, EU there um, last year, um, mm -hmm. I, I think from what they're saying alone, like uh, by the end of this year alone, anyway, awareness is going to become something that's um, you know in people's faces anyway. Like they're gonna, you know. Europe could be facing, um, uh, you know, a series of uh, wet bulb situations this year. They reckon anyway, like so. That's going to be, you know, letting a lot of uh, causing a lot of mayhem and crops and everything else. Like so, people are going to start waking up. I think by the end of the year anyway. They already are. They already know something's not fucking right anyway. Sorry for the language. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and all that plays into our favor because the world is getting so ready, even if they don't know it yet, they're getting really, really, really ready for our press conference. So that when it happens, they'll be like, oh my God, that's it. How could we not do what they're doing in Brooklyn? How could we not do that everywhere? My goodness, that's it. And you see, timing is everything. Well, it's not everything, but it's a big, big thing. And so, for example, when President Vicente Fox and I hit the world, Exactly six months after legalization, right? So a full half year had passed. The Obama administration still had not made any public declarations as to how they were going to treat us, right? So we came out swinging, right? And the world was ready for that. It's like, yeah, what the hell? Hundreds of thousands of people are dying in Latin America from this war that the United States is causing. Um, can we at least get an answer? Whether it's yes or no or, or, or anything in between, that's up to you. We just need an answer, Jack, right? And it was just like, boom, whoa. Go ahead, Sal. Um, I used to read a lot about revolution and um, I was reading up on the Russian revolution quite a lot of years ago. And something from my reading always stuck in my head. And that was that you had the intellectuals, the revolutionary avant-garde, they were in the front line. They were thinking way ahead of everybody else. And then you'd have this moment when the people who were asleep, who were just like, you know, focusing on all their petty things, they would suddenly awake, awaken. And it would be, it could be a little spark, a bit like what happened with the, the, the market stall holder in Egypt setting himself alight. I mean, that's what, or it could be a tiny little thing, just a quarrel in a supermarket or anything and there's this moment when everybody can come to consciousness it's quite a it's almost magical to think about it but through history it seems to have happened so they're, they're as dull as dishwater they're down there heads down squabbling squabbling about stupid petty things and then in that moment they're suddenly not only are they as enlightened as the avant-garde they actually overtake them 
And it struck me as a very interesting thing that that would happen. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what happened with the cannabis industry. We simply grabbed the conversation and then we owned it. And suddenly we were everywhere, right? And it changed the course of history. That's exactly what's gonna happen here with the press conference. But to do, the, but see the press conference for me has to talk about the whole trajectory. Even if at a summary level, talk about the goal, talk about the strategy, talk about what we're doing right here, right now. And then bam, like a ton of bricks, you know, <laughs> landing, whoa. Somebody um, brought up about what, I, think, I can't remember how far back it was. They brought up, well, what about plant-based? Will people take it on? And I don't think that's at all a problem. You just take it, take it as given that they'll take it on. You don't try and argue with anyone. Just the moments here, look, all the meat industry is in absolute chaos. They're all catching God knows what. The, the, the rivers are full of filthy waste and God knows what. Don't even argue the point. Uh, the argument's already been won. Plant-based, take it as given. Exactly. And the thing is, for your typical person, you know, sitting on their sofa in Iowa, United States, watching a big screen TV, watching all this unfold, right? What the food consists of is kind of secondary, right? The real, the big story is they're feeding everyone. Yeah. I don't give a shit what they're feeding them. They're feeding everyone, right? So just, just imagine, I'm going to do a little kind of a parallel. This is a folk tale, right? It's the Coke versus Pepsi folk tale. So imagine in the first deliveries to everyone, we deliver everyone these meal boxes, right? Let's say we don't get it quite right the first time, but we just get meal boxes to everyone, right? Meanwhile, our phones are ringing off the hook. The CEO of Pepsi is calling saying, we want Pepsis in every box. The CEO of Coke is calling saying, we want Cokes in every box, right? In the end, we make a decision and we go with one or the other, right? Which one got in the box? Not only does it not make the headline, it doesn't even make the story. The story is that we're feeding everyone. What? Whether it was Coke or who gives a rat's butt, right? Who gives a vegan rat's butt, whether it was Coke or Pepsi in the box? And that's where I think the vegans and the meat industry folks, they're like Coke and Pepsi. They don't understand that it's not about them anymore. We're up to something much, much bigger. Now, it just so happens that we've got our head screwed on right, so it's gonna be whole food, plant-based. Thank God, right? And um, that's actually part of our urgency to do this because if somebody else beats us to the punch and they're delivering you know, milk and bologna sandwiches from Oscar Mayer and everyone's cheering them on, ooh, you know, that's gonna be a problem for us, right? So we, we, we've gotta get it right and we gotta, we gotta do it fast. That's our urgency, okay? Um, but anyway, my, my point is, the story is the story, and it's not about some little petty squabble over here. The story is we're feeding everyone. The story is the community of Brooklyn and the larger community, including all the farms and CSAs and everything else, we're all coming together. And yes, we're working on making Brooklyn as self-sustainable as possible. But sister, when you got 2.6 million people in, in so many square miles, there's only so many cornfields that you can plow on so many you know, vacant lots in Brooklyn to feed 2.6 million people, all right? So yes, we have to think beyond growing. But having said that, along the strategy is, is, is investing and investing and investing in community gardens and community permaculture and people having, growing their own food in their own homes. Imagine youth brigades with practically hazmat suits going from apartment to apartment, setting up for people their, their hydroponics. We can't expect 2.7 million Brooklyners to become 2.7 million experts in hydroponics for crying out loud. That's like asking 2.7 million Brooklyners to all go to plumbing school this summer so they can all fix their own toilets. If, you, if, you're, if your crapper has a problem, you call the plumber. Any Brooklyner could tell you that, right? So this is 100% Brooklyn. You know, we'll, we'll have teams going around installing the permaculture stuff in your apartment for you. Yes, ma'am, if this is a good time, we're here to install. Oh, yeah, come on in. You know, don't mind the cat. No problem, ma'am. We got hazmat suits on. We're fine. 
So we won't infect you and you don't infect us and it's all fine. Uh, where would you like the uh, lettuce grow vertical? Well, over here I get good sunlight. Yeah, we already saw that from the floor plan. In fact, we had done a computer analysis and determined that this is actually the optimal spot. So if that works for you, that'll work best for the plants. Sure, that's fine. You know, and then for your uh, for your windowsill gardens, that's another team. They'll come next week. That that that's like the equivalent of the electrician. Oh, or are and, we expecting? And then, and then yeah. the roof garden. The roof. And then the roof garden. I'm telling you, this is Brooklyn coming together as a collective intelligence, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to bring back the Brooklyn Dodgers because this is how we're going to dodge the virus. This is how we're going to dodge the virus. Because up until now, Brooklyn's been getting hammered. This is the Lord of the Rings coming to their aid. The sun is rising in the east, and the keyhole is the press conference. That's the singularity within the singularity. The keyhole is the singularity. That's the, it's the door within the door. It's the door to which the key goes. It's the trim tab. It's the Buckminster Fullerian t trim tab. It's all those things. It's the it inside the it. And and as you mentioned, uh, you nobody's the whole of Brooklyn isn't going to become uh, experts in hydroponics, obviously, and setting them up. But once that's set up for them, you could encourage then the the idea behind it. Like we say, you have a whole block of apartments. And then you have the hydroponics set up in their apartments, and then you say, "Okay, come to your own arrangements. Tell me of what vegetables you're going to grow." And each person becomes um, uh, concentrates on one vegetable, and then harvest time, you just share out the vegetables between the whole block. Everyone gets an abundance of everything. You know, it's just cooperation in small ways, but everything, you know, small things help. Like. Yeah, and 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 the thing is, you know, in terms of the, you know. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. You know, capitalism was was kind of designed to sort of try to perfect that, right? But the bottom line is that everyone's situation is unique. Um, you know, I may be able-bodied, but I'm taking care of both my aging parents and my auntie at the same time. And you know, I. So th the bottom line, let's 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 take the accounting off the table for the moment. Feed everyone. Even the people who aren't leaving their apartments and doing anything economically productive. That gets back to my point earlier that capitalism and the market-based system, they're broken. They just don't work. Everything's broken. The car broke down, right? Oh, but if we tweak it here. No, no, no. It's broken. We need to hitch a ride. See, that's where humanity's at right now. We got here to this horrible wreck in a particular vehicle called free market capitalism. Um, we're now in a mangled mess on the side of the road. The car is burning. It's all crashed up. Any mechanic would laugh at the idea that you're going to get that thing back on the road again. And yet that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the old broken car in flames back on the road. They're saying, push, everybody push, push, push. The people pushing the bunker, pushing the back bumper are getting burned by the flames. That's the people who, who are being told, get back to work. I don't care that there's fucking corona. Get back to work, right? We're pushing a flaming, mangled, bent up, burning car and trying to push it down the interstate. And it's just not working. That's why we need to have the conversation, right? And it needs to be holistic. The goal is not just about feeding people. It's also cooling the planet. And more generally, it's about having a planet that's livable. And, and, and getting back to the Russian Revolution, help, help me out with the quote here, so which, which Russian writer said it about the revolution, but they said that the, the starving man does not dream of porridge. The starving man dreams of caviar. And so rather than try to say, hey, everybody, let's, you know, do this little tweak and we'll get the car back on the road and then we'll, what, limp down the highway a bit until the next wreck, uh, you know, can, can we can we deal with our problems here? And so, what we're talking about is not just, you know that would be a bowl of porridge here. This will this will this will this will hold you for a while, right? No, what we're talking about, what I think would be way more compelling, is if we actually talk about the goal, even if however briefly, right? But let's talk about the utopia that we want to get to, and then let's talk about the strategy to get us there. The strategy is basically food first. 
end the pandemic, heal people, right? And heal the planet in the process by going plant-based, 100% plant-based. Oh, you're on mute, so I don't, I, think, I don't know if you're trying to. And also these massive shifts have ha happened in history. For example, um, when, when we agreed to sanitation, first you used to throw the pot out the window and whoever was down below used to you know get covered and um, then there was cholera and then everybody came to the conclusion cholera is a bad thing so suddenly mass sanitation is on board and then we had a great shift when after the war when we here in UK we had the National Health Service um, there were plenty of naysayers saying oh no that's impossible all the doctors were saying it was impossible and the politicians literally had to stuff the mouths of the conservatives with money to get them to take the nhs on board but it was it was regarded as massively utopian but it it came into being so when people accuse you of utopian thinking for this type of thing feed, feed everybody you you just got to look at historically that these massive shifts in thinking have happened and things have been brought into being you know that is so brilliant so because and, and, and another reason i'm so glad you're here is because like here in the americas you know we just took sanitation as a as a as a given it's just for you take it for granted of course you have to have massive sanitation for the whole community right but but that's because we didn't go through the phase that London went through, where it started going through this hyper growth as a metropolis, but people were still throwing their shit out the window, just like they'd done on the farm 300 years ago. Because no one, had, because the shift had not been made. And I can totally hear these arguments about utopia. When everyone's knee deep in shit, it's kind of hard to imagine a world without shit, right? And yeah. so that, and that's where London was uh, at the time of these conversations. So I can totally see how utopian it is. Look, everybody's hungry. Yes, of course, it's hard to imagine a world without hunger because hunger is everywhere, right? And what a great parallel example. So, oh my goodness, you're hitting it outside the park. So you got so many gold stars today on your notebook <laughs> at school. You can't even see the notebook anymore. I, I, I just see a big pile of gold stars. <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah, that, 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 that's totally it. So, you know, what's the strategy? Food first, plant-based, end pandemics, end any form of hunger, malnutrition, anything like that. Um, and in so doing, we will get humanity on the same page to a degree that we never have before, right? Everybody knows that if, if people are not in harmony or understanding or whatever the best thing to do is just sit down and have a meal together you don't even have to talk about the thing just sit down have a meal together talk about football if you want right but have a meal together right this will be the first i want everyone to think about this for a moment this is like when when a person said imagine london with no poop and everything's clean and ha 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 that was ridiculous right so um when we say imagine a world where everyone is at home eating, you know, a good, balanced, healthy meal, healthy for you, healthy for Mother Earth, right? And, um, and compassionate towards all of our brother and sister species, like this chipmunk who's running around looking for seeds. Hello, buddy. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll show you real quick. Oh, he just scrambled out of view, but we'll, we'll, he'll be back. Anyway, um, when we're all eating together and all connected on zoom and we're all eating this delicious vegan stew it's like all of a sudden hey you know what being human actually ain't half bad when we were all in this collective gang fight right it kind of sucked you remember those days yeah i remember those days that sucked yeah that sucked let's not go back to that but now that we're here it's actually pretty cool right <laughs> Yes, Jackie. Um, I'm just, um, I don't know, it just came to me concerned about uh, the messaging because of everyone's already in so much fear and paranoia and distrust 
um, that I want to make sure that when we deliver this message that it's um, because it's so urgent and because we know the truth, it's almost like we really like, like so was saying, it's got to be such a huge movement that we're making. It's got to be so radical, but at the same time, to be very gentle that we can convince and influence these communities that we're coming in to support that this utopic vision is plausible, is we're living it. In this community, we're already living it. So we have to make it a felt experience for them, but at the same time, letting them know that the urgency without feeling like, you know, Mad Max is around the corner. I mean, like, even though it's true. <laughs> like, if we don't do something within months, that's our future that we're inviting, but we don't want to scare people. All, and we also don't want to be accused. I'm sorry, so I, I just don't want to be accused of trying to fear people into the vegan, you know, the vegan, uh, alt, you know, our, our message or, you see what I'm saying? So I'm trying to, I'm walking that line of, of being accused or should we even be concerned with that or. Oh, so your, your microphone's muted. I don't think you need to be in the least bit concerned about that. The thing is, it's just a just do it thing. The, the, the meal's already there at the door. You know, you're, you, there's, there's no convincing to be done. But I've, it's something I've learned. It's a bit, I've been very, very slow at learning it. It's that if you labour the point to try and convince somebody, they kind of know they're in this game of, oh, I'm supposed to be won over. I'm going to resist that. But if you just do it, it's a fait accompli. You, there's the door, there's the dinner. So you, you can put all that history behind you and they're naysaying. You know, people have always got a, a ten, 10 reasons why you can't do something, but they've never got the equivalent list of the, the 10 reasons why you can do something. They're, they're in the can't do mode. What can you do? You just you ride over it. That's, that's my view. Well, I was referring more to like the press conference. Like oh, okay, that. sorry, sorry. I thought you meant like the people. It's okay. No, it's it's actually both. It's a great point that you have. But I would, yeah, I was just referring to that like initial messaging because of like we said those, you know, the news media and how they don't want to cover this. And it's, a, it's an excuse to say it's a vegan agenda again. And so that's why I can only speak truth in story and just share our stories and just, being truth, like I do here in the communities locally, is like that same message. But I, I do, I'm just thinking about that little bit of that resistance that's not coming from so much, not even ignorance or, or just wanting to hoard or, or um, just that fear. People, there's so much, especially in Brooklyn, because they're in New York, that there's just so much fear. But I just want to be. Uh, cognizant of that and make sure that when we deliver the message that we're in touch in touch with that but people are more activated than if we were just normally going about and trying to do this and so to make sure that that yeah that we're not saying oh now we're feeding on their fear for a vegan agenda like this is our way in no 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 that, I, I, so, so, so you're on mute um and uh but no jackie i i'll, I'll speak after so go ahead so um, I bought a friend of mine a budgie because he was lonely and I got him this budgie. He actually wanted a parrot but because he liked the big size of a parrot. And I said, no way, parrots are way too expensive. So I got him a budgie and we took this budgie back to his place and um, we, we kept trying to give it flying lessons around the sitting room. But it, it just wouldn't fly. And there was a curtain, this budgie, you'd put it down, you know, come on out, buddy, come on out. This, you know, it would climb back up the curtain into its cage, a, a budgie, because it loved its cage. That's like these people who don't want changes. If they're attached, we'd all be like, we're all like it to some extent. We love the cage. We want to get back in the cage. We don't want to fly outside the cage. That's my story that all sticks in my head all righty beautiful and and really my, my point to jackie you know and, and that's why i told the story of coke versus pepsi right let just imagine right that you know we're in that hypothetical folk story of you know where we're delivering food to everyone for the first time and it's either coke or pepsi in the box let's say that we come to the conclusion that it should be pepsi 
right? I can hear the screams of the people saying, but Coca-Cola, they, they, they won't stand for it. They won't stand for it. It's irrelevant. What the hell is Coca-Cola going to do? Hijack our delivery trucks? Take out the Pepsis, pour them in the street and replace them? About, I mean, it's, it's absurd. What the hell is the meat industry going to do? Stop us? We're feeding hungry kids and hungry elders in wheelchairs for crying out loud. Healthy, high-protein, immune-boosting diets? And you're complaining because there's no Coke in the freaking box? It, it's absurd. And, and, and see, that's the thing. If you're, if you're head of marketing for Coke, all you think about is Pepsi. If you're head of marketing for Pepsi, all you think about is Coke. And I think that's where, that's where the vegans are at. You, you're, you're, you're losing the forest for this one blade of grass under some big oak tree deep in the forest that no one's ever seen before in their lives. Nobody knows about veganism. Nobody cares. In this times right now, I hate to say it, nobody cares whether it's Coke or Pepsi in the damn box right? We care, but nobody else does. So let's let nobody else keep being nobody else, right? That's not, the, that's not the opportunity here. The opportunity here is to get the world's attention. And yes, plant-based is a part of it. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying that's not where the battle is. That's not where the battle is going to be fought and won. So let's get our eye on the ball. And not on some petty little Coke versus Pepsi thing. I know it's not little like that. It's big. It's big. It's big. It's big. I, I get it. Yeah. Right? But what I need you to get is that's not where the battle is right now. It's just not. It's just not. The story is this. Here's the image, okay? When we do the press conference, immediately after the press conference, the press is going to be invited to walk out of the building and onto the street where there's going to be a fleet of 20 trucks delivering food that was prepared in the previous 48 hours. And they're gonna say, oh my God, it's happening, right? See, that's the realization. That, the press conference today with President Vicente Fox, our battle was won before we walked out of that room. Even though it took the Obama administration a full three months, a couple days under a three months, which shows that they were adhering to the internationally accepted time period for, for, for requests like this from, the, from a former head of state of a major country. Um, but before we left the press conference, it had already clicked for people. This thing's go, this thing's a go. That was the press conference. This thing's a go, all right? And when people walk, so the day that we launch this and do the press conference and the delivery, the first delivery is of food, it just clicked for me that that needs to be a part of it. We need to be delivering. Right, you walk out of the press conference, you, you jump into a truck and we're delivering. Bring your cameras, bring your microphones. Yeah, yeah, you know, that gaffer dude or whatever that, yeah, bring him too, you know, all that stuff. And we're going on the road. And the message is then, wow, like it or not, this is happening. What do you imagine? A bunch of anti-communists with signs saying, stop feeding people. Stop feeding it's communists. I swear this is part of a communist plot. That, that would be the equivalent of like some meatheads. Uh, meat is good. Put meat in the... What? Are you kidding? Dude, get the hell out of the road, Jack, or we'll freaking arrest you. Right? You know? I mean, it's, it's absurd. We could make up all these boogeymen and boogeywomen, but... There's nothing in the closet here. I'm shining the light. There's nothing in the closet. In other words, when we do this, it's a go. Period. Right? Ain't no yeah. one can stop us. Yeah, and, and um, anybody, the, like I said, there was about two weeks ago in the block party there as well. The, the idea of behind the vegan, like if anyone says, like, who, who's, who do you think you are? Is this about veganism or anything? Even the word veganism doesn't have to be used in the, in, in, in the press conference in the sense that, as I said, even John Doyle says, it, that video now that I'm talking about, they're talking to Stuart Scott, he said it himself, the world is not going to go back to normal. And I suspect that we don't need the thousands of pounds a ton of um, uh beef, meat, and steaks every day. He said, people are going to have to realize. He said, vegans won't have to, uh, won't have to uh, try and encourage people anymore. People are going to realize for themselves now shortly 
that we have no alternative but to live on a plant-based diet because you know just there, there won't be any alternative we're not going back to normality that's what he's making out music that's what the video is called we're not going back to normal there'll be no more normal very shortly Yeah, it, exactly. And, um, you know, l let me do one more kind of comic fairy tale. Imagine that there is a luxury cruise ship, bunch of rich people on it, and the ship starts sinking. And it's going down, it's going down. The next thing you know, people are swimming in the water. The water's not that cold, so they're hanging. Uh, and let's say there's this one woman in there who's just so into fashion and just detests polyester. It's got to either be silk or cotton or I don't know what, but no polyester, right? Uh, now she's floating in the water. Ma'am, can I throw you a life preserver? I'm going to throw it right to you. You ready? You ready, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. And she says, um, is it made of polyester? No one's going to be asking if the life preserver is made of polyester. They're going to say, throw me the damn, right here. Yes, best boy, throw me that life preserver. I don't care what it's made of, right? And that, that's where I say, um, we've got to get beyond the petty crap and focus on the damn life preserver, regardless of what it's made of. Now, we know it's important that it's got to be plant-based, okay? And that'll be an important part of the press conference. It's just not the headline, and it's not the battle. The headline is, holy shit, they're doing it. They're feeding everyone. And that leads to a burning question. Who the hell is this they? Is it the Quakers? Is it the Hare Krishnas? Right? Is it United Way? Uh, city government. They're finally stepping up. Hallelujah. Uh, who, who's, who, who's doing it? That's the question, people. Not is it Coke or Pepsi in the box? Right? Um, and I'm not saying this to anyone on this call. I'm just saying it to the universe. Get over it. That's not what this is about. I see you got your hand up, uh, so I'll, I'll call you in a second. And, um, uh, but, you know, I love this clarity. This is a moment of clarity like we've never had before, I feel. In all my thousands of hours <laughs> of video conferencing, never have we had this clarity. It's so clear. Exactly where we need to start and what the story is. Back to you, so. Um, right, we, because of COVID-19, we've already had the impossible happening. I, I expect it's the same for you over there. Everybody being paid without having to go to work. Um, small businesses being given their money. Um, homeless people staying in lovely hotels, being treated absolutely lovely, having meals delivered into lovely hotel bedrooms. Um, you know, we've got lots of stories of that happening in London, you know, so already these impossible problems have been overcome somewhat, you know, not everybody got to go in the hotel, there's another story going on simultaneously, but um, all these impossible things have happened, so this is the moment when all the big utopian things that were never even, even conceived as the possible, they suddenly, they have happened and they can happen. And they will happen. Yeah, this is like the Italian Renaissance, right? Suddenly, you know, somebody's chiseling away and he chisels a penis out of, out of marble for, you know, for crying out loud. Uh, you know, a woman notably faints in the plaza where it's erected, so to speak. And, uh, you know, Rome was never the same again. And then it just spread. Everyone just felt liberated and started expressing. I'm, I'm recapping history here. <laughs> not it didn't happen like that i'm sure but i'm just you know I'm, I'm creating a folk tale about how it happened thank you so and and that's it and and here's here's the larger point see right now everything got shaken up the house of cards is being flattened and now you got all these cards on the table what are you going to build right anything that we build will be welcome frankly at this point but there will be a singularity there will be a story that will that will spread around the world about a solution, a holistic solution to actually solve our problems and confront, in a very gentle way, the elephant in the room. 
how are we gonna survive this bottleneck, right? See, everyone's trying to answer that question individually. The real innovation is we're gonna, we're gonna get out there and in a very public way, we're gonna answer, answer it collectively. And we're gonna say, listen, we are not gonna be like the others who go and try to create their own little bunker in their backyard and say, forget you world, forget you Brooklyn, forget you projects, forget you uh, First Nations peoples, forget you black and brown peoples, forget you uh, impoverished peoples of all kinds, for, forget you peoples who are in droughts, areas of drought, forget all of you. I'm taking care of me, right? Um, so that is suddenly being replaced with the alternative, which is what we're doing in Brooklyn with the Brooklyn Singularity. By the way, it's a little bright here today with sun and clouds and stuff. I'm not trying to look cool. Um, but anyway, just give my eyes a little rest. But that's, um, you know, that's exactly what we're doing with the Brooklyn Singularity. Brooklyn Eats, right? We're showing the world a different way. And guess what? The world is gonna fall in love. The world is gonna fall in love. Brooklyn is the original neighborhood of the world. Why? It's the original neighborhood above any other place in the world where everybody came and blended, right? And yes, they kept their own identity. See, Brooklyn is a community of communities. It's a community of communities, right? And each community has its own identity and its own this and its own that and its own whatever you want, right? Polish, Irish, Jewish, Black, Puerto Rican, uh, Jamaican, you know, it's got it all. And um, it, it's, you know, it's the coolest thing. And yet it's one big community of communities. So it's kind of, it's, it's the world we want in miniature, right? And because we blast it off as the singularity, um, within the singularity, the first singularity is Brooklyn. The singularity within the singularity is the press conference, the media event. When those red trucks start delivering and the people with the hazmat suits and the cool logo on the back with the green leaf or whatever the heck, I mean, people are, their jaws are gonna drop. Their jaws are gonna drop, right? Like for example, in the press conference with President Vicente Fox, the guy sitting to my right was President Fox. The guy sitting to my left was, my, uh, was John Davis, drug policy expert. After the press conference and the whole wave of media, I said, John, what's been the, the response of the drug, the international drug policy community? He said, he said, this was their response. This is exactly what he said. That was the response then. That will be the response now with this. It'll be shock and awe. They're feeding everyone will be the story. Yes, Jackie. So because we, it's not just a press conference, but it's everything that we have to have in place in order to like show and implement right after the press conference. How do we even, I can't even fathom. I, can't, I wish I could be in your brain. Oh, well, here, well, let, let, me, let me put my brain on speakerphone. Yeah. Right? I'm like, how are we doing? Where there's so many moving parts. How do we get uh, all? No, 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 sister, sister. Let, let me show you the ways of the force. All right, you're you're in Yoda's cave right now. Watch your head, okay? <laughs> so here, here's here's how this is gonna go down. All right, um, we so this conversation. Remember back to steps one, two, three. We got to perfect this communication. That's quite broad. That covers the whole spectrum from goal to step number one. Master that step. And then step number two is lay out a great roster of topics focused on Brooklyn, focused on the Brooklyn, the, the Brooklyn singularity, right? Lay out the roster. This is it. We're going to talk about this and this and this. And then start inviting all these communities from Brooklyn, including the mayor's office, including, you know, church, everyone, just everyone at once. Put out a call, plaster it all over the Facebook pages, all over Brooklyn right? Call your friends, tell them, call churches, call, 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 email, email, post, post, right? Look, and we're not, it's not like we're, 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 a, we're a team, an army of 20,000 marketers who can just, you know, we're, we are who we are and we start where we start, right? That's stone soup. 
That's stone soup. You start where you start. You start where you are. Here's where we are. We're not somewhere else. We're right here. So we start with what we got. We start with the team that we've got, but this team is going to grow and grow and grow and grow, and it's going to grow like crazy, especially as we map out the topics and invite guest speakers to specific topics. We've already modeled it within the Divine Feminine, with the two-hour segment afterwards, which, you know, and last the last two-hour segment, you know, of, with, with, with Silish and John and everyone, for me, that was just kind of a waste of time. Uh, not a waste because it actually woke me up to what's missing and here's what's missing the conversation we got to start with the conversation everything begins with the conversation there's only one game in town right now and that's the conversation if it's about anything other than the whole picture from goal to strategy to steps one two three if it doesn't include all of that i'm not interested in the conversation so to be very explicit i am simply not interested in having a conversation about an app that excludes the big picture, not interested. And it actually needs to start with the big picture. You start with the big picture. Once upon a time, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you know, boom, right? Start with the big picture. Then let's get to step, okay, step, step number three is an app, great. Now, I'm, now you got me, now you got me. But if you're not willing to have the conversation, then, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I seriously wanna like put up a notice on Radish uh, for the block party and for the solution club, every conversation starts with the conversation. Go, go, go ahead, Seb, go ahead. Um, right, I made a little note of this because I think it, it, it sounds um, like the thing, if you like. Right, you've got the elephant in the room. It's filling it up, like you said, but we just dismantled the building around it. Then there's just elephant and there's no room for it i love it and and one cool thing about that is the elephant is the symbol of the republican party in here in the united states <laughs> Trump and all that. The, 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 really republicans give me a break come is that, on. Is that, the, is that the legitimate symbol or is oh, it just I, I, I i i am not joking it's literally the elephant and so, and since Donald Trump is that, he is the elephant on top of the pyramid of money, of power, <coughs> you know, and, and so now there's just, there's no room for the elephant. I love it. And we don't even have to take aim at the Republicans, right? The symbolism says it all. But also, you, when you dismantle the building, you're dismantling the society where, where that elephant could even be accommodated. So there is just an elephant and there's space. At last, there's space. All right, we got someone else joining. Akshay, welcome. Thank you. How are you doing? Hi. Not too bad, how are you? Doing awesome, doing awesome. We're in the middle of a great conversation. We're recording, I'm gonna pause for